Have you ever wondered how to build a machine for data science work? For years, I struggled with trying to find clarity on a system that could deliver that. Too often, they confuse developer systems and training-only systems with data science, and I wanted to settle the answer myself on what the system could be. In this multi-part series, I'll break down how I designed and tested the system, along with a bit of background on the data science space itself. Hi, everyone. It's David Liu here. Today, I'd like to talk to you about data science and the hardware and software that makes up data science performance and why it's worth making a video over. Full disclosure, I work for Intel as a data science and AI solutions engineer. So let's get started. Let's talk first about what the data science process is in the AI lifecycle. In the AI lifecycle, you do data science and exploration, then model development and evaluation, and then finally model deployment. It can be subdivided into more steps, but we're trying to keep it simple here. Regardless of what the end model is, such as machine learning or deep learning, the data science process precedes the model training and deployment. Let's drill down to the next layer. Data science work has a few distinct phases. Data ingress, data exploration, pre-processing, model selection, final model training, and a handoff or model deployment. The phases of exploration, pre-processing, and model selection take the lion's share of the time because some strategies don't pan out and you must try another strategy to create a usable model. This is the core part of where most data scientists spend the most time. The main problem data scientists deal with is the problem of data exploration and pre-processing, the core task of data science. Because of the explorative work that goes on, fitting it into in-memory data frames is preferred. Sometimes you deal with improperly formatted data, missing data, or data that needs to be transformed. These data munging tasks are the core of frameworks such as Pandas. Ask any data scientist, and this is the bane of their everyday work. Basically, if the data set fits into memory, it grants almost all required algorithms and data frame manipulation methods necessary. It can handle intermediate results from data frame operations. While some great distributed frameworks have helped solve specific out-of-memory problems, they still have their own set of gaps to handle. For Dask, this solution does not have full Pandas API support, which means specific data frame operations aren't supported in addition to Dask being less performant than an in-memory equivalent. For general classical machine learning and stats, scikit-learn lacks distributed implementations, but some extensions can grant partial support of distributed to some algorithms. At the end of the day, you are essentially fighting non-uniform memory access, or NUMA, either single-node CPU socket NUMA, or what we call network NUMA, wherein the latency and overhead of multi-node systems comes into play. Many of the data frame and machine learning algorithms used by data scientists don't scale that well at all. So reducing the problem to a single node in-memory computation removes most of the barriers. Now you may wonder why go through all this effort to have as much of the algorithms and capabilities as possible. Well, let me tell you something I've seen from both a practitioner and legal perspective. It's called bias by model selection. Let's say, for example, that you chose to use a deep learning algorithm because their algorithms are commonly offered in a distributed implementation and you can skip the in-memory problem. By doing so, you are also cutting out an entire section of non-distributed algorithms or classical machine learning algorithms that have more explainability. Then let's say you use this model to approve or decline a loan. By doing so, you've introduced bias by model selection because you have chosen to cut out the entire data science process with the full data set and full set of algorithms. If you're sued in court, not showing due diligence on the model selection and development process can potentially make you lose the case. Developing and using a computer system that can provide me the due diligence evidence if audited on my model development and selection was pivotal as I've had to stand behind my data science work and I have seen others lose court cases from choosing algorithms with distributed implementations or by downsampling the problem to fit into small memory systems or hardware. As of April 2021, there's also new draft proposals on the European Union regulation of high-risk AI systems, which might eventually enforce this requirement on showing one's model work. As such, I think it is a sign of things to come as AI has started to affect our everyday lives more and more. Link in the description if you want to know more about this new draft regulation. Let's get to the exciting part of this video, 
the design of the system. Looking through various technologies on the market, I stumbled upon an interesting product called Intel Optane Persistent Memory. Now this memory is significantly faster than an SSD and only a bit slower than normal DRAM. However, the added advantage is it can run in what is called a memory mode where it becomes part of the addressable memory pool. This is the most interesting part of the product. Remember when I said single node memory helps solve problems? You can run up to four or six of these Optane persistent memory modules mixed in with DRAM to get a massive memory pool. For Intel's Cascade Lake Xeon SP systems, that means up to four terabytes with the right part. And Ice Lake SP systems will carry that forward for all parts. At high memory configurations, Optane is significantly cheaper than LRDIMS or DRAM, which is also smaller in capacity than Optane. Configuration-wise, I'll need to have some DRAM to balance out the Optane persistent memory modules. Typically, you want at least one eighth of the memory to be DRAM, so we'll decide at the motherboard stage to settle the DIMM config. Next, let's tackle the CPU. Now, I'm sure most of the industry thinks more CPUs and cores is better, but there's growing evidence that this may not be true in the data science space. Because of the in-memory dataset workflow of both data frames and classical machine learning algorithms used for exploration, you want to reduce NUMA as much as possible from both the CPU and core count perspective. The amount of vectorization in popular frameworks like NumPy and SciPy, along with machine learning and deep learning libraries means that AVX2 and AVX512 frequency matter more. So I'll be choosing a single socket CPU with about 18 cores. This should help limit the CPU frequency drop while also tackling oversubscription and nested parallelism problems in many of the AI frameworks. Also, while on the topic of tackling oversubscription problems, I have a video from SciPy and EuroPython on the topic. Link in the description below. Next, let's build the system. From a DIY perspective, the easiest motherboard is the X11 SPA TF board manufactured by Supermicro. It also sports a single socket with 12 DIMM slots instead of 8, which will help with my data science configuration that utilizes Optane persistent memory. I know you can buy a pre-made workstation chassis from Supermicro with this motherboard, but I thought it would be more fun to build one myself. Next, the memory configuration. In order to have the Optane to DRAM ratio of 8 to 1, I'll need 6 modules of 512GB Optane persistent memory, along with six modules of 64 gigabyte DRAM DIMMs. This gives me a uniform and symmetric configuration of a six by six, granting a total of three terabytes of Optane persistent memory and 384 gigabytes of DRAM, a grand total of about 3.3 terabytes. At the OS level, it should report about three terabytes with this configuration. For the fans, I'll be using Noctua fans in my chassis along with some Corsair memory coolers as I don't have a traditional fan shroud for my custom case. On the topic of this case, I'm using an EATX sized Corsair 5000D chassis. GPU wise, I'm using a low power NVIDIA P1000 to render my monitors. The GPU in this case is only for rendering the screen and not for AI purposes as the data science process rarely requires a GPU. If one needs to test a deployment, one can always add cards in to temporarily test. I have the OS installed on an NVMe drive and extra SSD for some local file space. Assembling the chassis was a bit more involved as I had to add extra offset holes to the Corsair case for the unique Supermicro board, but otherwise straightforward after mounting the CPU to the cooler and then followed by the motherboard, then the power supply connections, memory installation, and then OS installation. I've installed Windows 10 for workstations and Windows Subsystem for Linux, or WSL2, as it is fast becoming a great alternative to a pure Ubuntu install. Here's a look at the final system. Cool and quiet with the Noctua fans and a system that sits under my desk where I can easily mount dataset disks into system memory. Let's power it up and get a preview of how the WSL2 experience is. WSL2 can address a total of about 2.5 terabytes of the total 3 terabytes of system memory, which is fantastic. I also have all my Windows-based tools and enterprise applications. A data science system that has the best algorithm support along with the best in-memory capacity to handle many of today's large data sets. 
In the next part of the series, we'll test the system and explore the capabilities it grants to data science workflows. Stay tuned for part two.